So Christopher, um, I thought I would start with you. Um, and if you were a fashion industry executive, say the CEO of Burberry, or the CEO of another brand out there that's in the past, and I should mention, by the way, that Burberry has announced that it will no longer destroy product. Um, but if you're, if you're faced with this challenge of having all this unsold merchandise, <coughs> using your AI, machine learning, data, research, thingy, uh, multifaceted, crazy smart skill set, what would you do? Um, so, can everybody hear me? Yeah, yeah okay, cool. I was, I was just always check. Um, so, I, w every piece of unsold clothing, I think, is actually just, um, you know, a failure of matching supply and demand. It's actually pretty much that simple. It's just you've, you've overproduced or you haven't distributed appropriately. So it might have been that, you know, had that, you know, unit gone to another shop or another country, you might have been able to sell it. Um, and so I think understanding that, because um, a lot of, a lot of uh, fashion companies, they look at the supply chain and they look at the sort of the mechanics of it from sort of production to distribution, but actually understanding that the supply chain um, starts and ends with your consumer. And so understanding um, consumers will help you optimize your supply chain because you will better understand what it is that they want to buy and not want to buy. Um, so, you know, if I were Burberry or any company, investing in AI will allow you to um, not only better match your, um, your units of clothing uh, to your customers and therefore make more money, but you'll be able to make more money with less units of clothing. Uh, less waste. And so it's one of the few examples, I think, in, in any industry where there is both an argument in, in profit and profitability to invest in AI and also an argument in sustainability to invest in AI, where being more sustainable will actually make you more money. Right. So if I were Burberry or any company, investing in AI is something that might be wise. Okay. Arthi, you've been working on this at H&M for some time now. Yes. Um, where did you guys start at H&M, and how, you know, how did it all unfold that um, this became an initiative, which I understand is gaining quite a lot of importance given your new star hire? Absolutely. Uh, I'm happy that you talked about it here in this, this venue. Uh, this, is, this started maybe a couple, two, just a little bit more than two years ago, and it is exactly from that, you know, the stuff that Chris is saying, that we saw that we, can, we have so much data that we can help us to optimize the whole value chain. And it's not only about, a lot of people think about AI, think about the you know, personalization, the customer facing part, but there's so much to do in to understand also how our supply chain can be better and optimize that. Everything from how you, you know, trend for, um, forecasting trends to how you quantify how many pieces you're gonna buy, how you distribute those garments to the right country, the right store, to the right place, in the right time, and then, comes the part with the communication, the customer facing, in personalization, personal promotion, or whatever that might be, and also setting prices. And this is where we, ex you know, spending our, our investment on to, to capture every bits and pieces of the value chain. And exactly as Chris said, utilizing data on the customers, and it, it very, it doesn't have to be on a personal level. It could be on an aggregated level. You understand and you can top it off on the transactional data that we have. We have over 900 million transactions yearly. We have billions of people visiting our websites. We have millions of people in our club data. That gives a lot of data. Uh, as one colleague of mine told me, he said that it's our customers talking to us, right? So if we put that data on top of the, what we have, then we can be more precise and be more stop, you know, what we usually talk about stop guessing what you can calculate. Right. Because that helps you be more precise on sharper decision making. So making sure that you do not overproduce and making sure you send the right garment to the right place, we can actually both be more sharper in the decision making, making sure that we make right, you know, from a, from a business perspective, but we're also very, you know, more sustainable, how we impact the, you know, the environment. It's not only about the garment itself, but also transporting, storaging, it's so much CO2 impact that we can actually remove by being that. And we see that in some of the tests that we can actually affect a lot, and then think about doing that in every market. I think the whole industry doing that, what impact that could entail. Amazing. So just so we can understand it better, can you give us a specific 
example of where, you know, along that huge H&M value chain, supply chain, give us a real life example of how you have put this into practice. Well, we are doing things in, I mean, as I said, we're doing it for two years now. We are, uh, we are testing things, we're piloting, we're actually rolling things out globally in different markets, and, and we're, we're a big company. We're in almost 70 markets, and there's a, there's a basic global part, but then you have the local part, and then you get the personalized part. So you need to do things in different stacks and at the same time because there's also the world is disrupting, right? Everything's going so fast. So you need to make sure you're on top of things. So we're testing in different things in different areas. We're running whole, maybe scaling whole concepts by optimizing how we allocate those concepts. A very good thing of, uh, example of that is the store that you visited when you were in Stockholm. There's a store in a, in a shopping mall. This store is a typical shopping mall of a maybe a size A, B, and C that we used to have before. Because as a human, you make template to make things much more easier to see. And in that's that typical store uh, or shopping mall, we would have put a kind of specific kind of store, a very you know standard neighborhood store, and it was doing good, but not as good as it could have done. Adding the data, looking at the actual customers are buying them, what are they buying, what are the concepts, then you start defining the old way of thinking that uh, that store should have this because it's of that size. No, that store need to have these stuff, these concepts. We need to allocate those garments in that specific store and not move them anywhere so else. So it's not just about the size of the store, it's the neighborhood the store is in, the people that yeah. tend to frequent that store, exactly. their purchasing it's habits. It's, it's understand and that even is how they move center. through the store. I mean, the, yes. cool, the cool thing about this store is that uh, when I when I went in, it um, it actually looks quite different than a lot of H and M stores because there's half of the product there. It's 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 actually looking at like can you sell more stuff with less? Right. Yes. And which it, is counterintuitive in a way because sometimes you walk into an H and M store and it's just like avalanche of stuff, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, it, it's it's quite interesting. You walk in and there's all kinds of. Um, you know, little devices that give feedback, both to you as the customer, but also then to the sh to the shop. Looking at where people go, where should the where should the clothing be? Like even um, asking people in the changing rooms, um, are 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 you currently satisfied right now, uh, and why? Like and and um, you know, the thing that's that's quite cool about that is that um, it it. It extends, there's, there's fundamental aspects of, of these technologies that you can apply, not just in H&M, but you can apply, you know, there's, what is it, is eight, nine, nine brands now yeah. within the H&M yeah, yeah, H &M group. And so you can apply, it doesn't matter if you are costs or if you are, you know, Arquette or whatever, these are things that you can, you can apply across the, across the group to make the experience better for people. Yeah. You know, and those can it, connect. Yeah, like it, ma it, it makes me think, though, our dear Albert was talking to us about the importance of intuition, you know, instinct, the right brain side of our industry. So how do, you, how do you guys see the kind of power of the left brain data, analytics, like all of that, like predictive stuff, with the like creativity and intuition and the kind of just knowing that the right yeah. thing is, you know, being ahead. Actually, internal H&M, we, we never talk about artificial intelligence. We refer to AI as amplified intelligence. Because what we're doing, we're providing tools and data to make sharper decision making. The decision making still is on the human. We know the business. We've done fashion for plus 70 years. But the world is changing. It's more complex. So we need to provide data. I mean, we've seen the project where, in a, uh, where we were helping a designers with trend forecasting. It's not because of the fact that the designer could not forecast a trend, it, because the designer now had a tool to be able to talk to the controller, saying, listen, my gut feeling says this product is going down, and now the data says the same thing. Uh -huh. So now I can make sure that I'm amplifying my competence and making sure I can talk to the business guy and say, you should not buy that product, because I can see this, that my gut feeling is empowered by the data. T before you always look at BI as tools, you know, descriptive what has happened. This is predictive, helping you to decide better forward. If that is statistic, this is probability. Okay. So by helping probability, you can be a little bit more so sharp. So what if and this, this, okay, go ahead, Chris. <laughs> and, and so one of the things, so I, I love fashion because it's so creative and interesting and fun. And, you know, th that, and the, the, one of the things that I say, because I interact with a lot of designers, and often they kind of go, ooh, like, 
ooh, data, I'm, I'm not a math person, or, you know, or every time I talk to somebody who's done research, they always tell me I can't do something, you know, like, oh, that won't sell, or that won't. And one of the things that I say is actually, good use of data will help amplify your creativity, because if you have an idea, if you like this, there's surely other people like you that will like this thing. And previously, you know, a lot of things would be turned down because, you know, there wouldn't necessarily be enough understanding or a route to, 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 to market to take this kind of weird and wonderful thing and find where that market is. Because it might be that that market is actually distributed in a narrow segment that's, you know, pan-geographic. And, and, but now, we can say, okay, there's this cool niche thing. Actually, we'll be able to potentially find a market for it. There's this niche place right here that might buy that thing. Or there might be a little bit of customers all over the place so we might be able to, we might not put it in a shop, we might have it online, but there might be a market for that. And so the cool thing about better understanding of the market is that actually I really genuinely think that um, AI is one of the solutions to dehomogenizing the market and actually enhancing the diversity of the market in terms of design and enhancing people's creativity. Because you, you could have more variety. You can have more variety and and sell that variety because you'll be able to understand where should that variety go right. and how to reach out to the people who might like that variety. Okay. If you look at our company, sorry, this is so interesting. I'm so passionate about this. We have... That's why you're here. Yeah. <laughs> you know, in our projects that we're running across every part of the organization, the ones that are leading the project are the business side. Is the designers, is the buyers, is the sales guy, is the merchandiser. They're driving the project. I'm enabling them with the data analytics and my beautiful brains that I have in my teams. They're creating all these great, cool algos. But they're the ones running the business, running the projects. So there's a huge pull from the organization because they feel that we're amplifying them and not taking over. So it is, you know, data, it's art and science, it's human and machine, it's gut feeling and data together. You know what I love about this? I love that this is like, a positive technology story from today. We've had uh, tech is cool. Data yeah. is cool. Yeah, like there's, so, there's so like amazing things that you can do with data. It doesn't have to be evil. Right. So both of you, thirty seconds each. Fast forward five years. You know what do you think? You know you've you've been here today. You've heard about the challenges with climate change and greenhouse gases and overproduction and like waste and plastic and all the problems we have in the world with regards to our environment. What do you think is the real potential impact of this technology? Chris? So all of the critiques of fashion, you look at, this is, it's not just sustainability, as we heard earlier, like labor, labor rights violations and monitoring of factories. Creating a smart supply chain from beginning to end will enable the fashion sector to reduce the amount that they produce and reduce the waste that they produce, um, maintain profitability, but also de-stress and, and give breathing space to that supply chain. And that allows you not only to reduce your, your carbon emissions, but also in, in monitoring factories and um, you know, being able to uh, create less demand on those factories, you could also improve labor standards. Sure. And, like and maintain profitability. Yeah. This, is the, this is the amazing thing. You can have your cake and you can eat it. Right. And like Albert said, you know, Albert was talking about the like eight collections, 16 collections. It feels like sometimes the way that we've been trying to solve the problems in the industry is just by producing more stuff and hoping someone's going to buy it, you know? And I think producing it, less will get you more. Exactly. Uh, and for us, sustainability is a core thing. It's part of our goals, a part of our mindset, everything we do, even in the part of it where we talk about the AI. I, I work very closely to our head of sustainability, uh, Anna Yedda, and very much in everything, bits and pieces we talk about, every bit, everything we do has a sustainability perspective to it. There's also part of the sustainability, it's not only about the environment, but it's also about the human and ethics. So we're actually also taking the leadership to put ethics in, in AI in the forefront. We're not, we haven't solved that problem yet, but right. it's an area we need to make sure that we understand because there's a lot of bias in the data, there's a lot of things you can do in the wrong way with the data, and we realize that. I think we are one of the few companies that have a head of AI policy that she is Linda Leopold, she's working with this on a daily basis to make sure that can we do right things? Are we utilizing data in the right way? Are we truthful to our customer? Are we transparent to our customer? That's important. GDPR is just like hygiene factor. We need to notch it up much higher. 
And then you actually have a different spin on it when it comes to the fashion industry. Okay, well, I really look forward to seeing how this all evolves. Congratulations on your new role. Cheers. And um, Arthi, thank you for coming down from Sweden for this. Um, please help me in uh, thanking Christopher and Arthi. Thank you. Thank you.